This video is uh, for my Grizzly G1026 uh, Shaper. Um, I had an issue where when I got it straight from the factory uh, that the spindle deflection was over 10 thousandths when you would lock the height adjusting knob. So in case you don't know, most people probably do, but in case you don't know, the height of lo locking no uh, adjustment knob is over here. So what you're going to do is use the front hand crank here to raise your bit up to the height that you want your bit set at to do whatever cut you're doing. And then you would come over to here and lock the adjusting height adjusting knob in so that it doesn't move up or down while the unit's running. Um, just so you can see, I'll unlock it. Uh, okay, it's un unlocked right now. It's unlocked. So I'm going to lock it. This is just a cheap dial indicator from, I think, Harbor Freight or something like that that I use. It's not, it's not what I use for my good things, but it works and stuff like this. So uh, that's zero. If I tighten this down, you'll see um, my deflection is less than a quarter of a thousandth now, from ten thousandths to a quarter. So I don't have the issue with the, uh, the bit change in uh, positions on me. How I accomplished this was uh, the reason why I'm doing the video. First, you have to remove your fences, which I don't have the originals. I made the the um, Corian fences over here to replace the pressed board that they had, the MDF. And uh, that's worked out great. Um, I don't use the safety device because it just it maybe with a shaper head, I use it more for router bits than I do for shaper cutters. So uh, it's I just don't find it very useful. I did a make a dust collection box for this out of some scrap wood. Uh, I have a video on that, but it's not posted yet because my internet sucks. It's really bad, and it takes me literally to do a, a, a six minute video. It's going to take me three or four hours to upload it. It's it's. CenturyLink, which is garbage. I live in the country, so. But anyway, how you do this is uh, you take your fences off because they'll get in the way of you removing this throat plate that's in here. You'll take the three screws, you know, there's three three screws in a triangular pattern. You'll pull that out. You'll be able to take all these inserts out with the table top so that you can gain access to look at what you're doing. You don't have to do this, but I found it easier to do because um, I'm using a dial indicator and I want to see the movement. I can't see it with this throat plate in there as well. So um, the dial indicator would show me that either way, but I like to visually look. I have a bit in there and, uh, you know, I used a piece of wood just to gauge it. And it's just the way I did it. You don't have to do it that way. But, um, but anyway, the what I'll show you is uh, first I'm going to put the bit back to a height where... I can show you the access to the bolts. So we'll, we'll get that back. Okay, remove my dust collection hose out of here that I was. I blew it down so that you can see. But if you'll notice inside here, there are four what they call gib adjustment screws. Right here is two. There's one right here and another one that's sort of hidden behind this plate right here. If you bring your unit down low enough, you can gain access to these. But what I'm going to tell you is, is that um, it's, it's better to try and do this with this up. See this exposed gib section here? If you lower this down too far, the exposed section up here won't have the backing of this plate and you can actually deflect it worse. So what I recommend doing is that bring this up to the top, adjust these gib screws here, then you can move it down a little bit to get to these two and do that. And what you do is loosen these lock nuts. These are 12 millimeter, um, lock nuts and these are four millimeter allen screws right here okay so what you're going to do is you're going to put your you know your four millimeter allen screw in there hold the gib adjustment screw and back off these lock nuts to where you can run them in and out without the nut 
jamming back up on here. Then what you want to do is, once you have enough room, you want to run these screws in until they hit touch. You'll feel resistance. You don't want to over tighten these, so you're not, you know, you're not trying to tighten these like you would a bolt. All you're going to do is run down until it hits and is snug, finger tight. Once it's finger tight, you're going to back this Allen head out one tenth of a turn and tighten this lock adjusting screw, this lock adjusting nut right here. And you want to hold the Allen wrench while you do it. If you don't hold the Allen wrench while you do it, that position will change and it'll affect the whole setup. So what you want to do is, you know, loosen this nut out to the point where you have full adjustment of this screw, run that screw in until it hits. You'll feel it hit the gib. Once it hits the gib, back it off a tenth, hold the Allen wrench in place, tighten the lock nut. You're going to do that for each one of these. And you want this to where this is supported. So in other words, when this is raised up here, you want to do these gib screws when this is up here, not when it's down, because if it's down, this has free play. There's nothing to back it. So you want to make sure that this is up to at least up to here. Then if you want to lower it down so that you can gain access and you'll move this green area down to here, this still will have a plate up on it. So it still, it still will be fine. And you just do the same thing with those. Then what you're going to do is after you've tightened those down and you've backed off a tenth and locked those nuts down, then you're going to go back to the front of the shaper and you're going to run your height adjustment knob you're going to run your height adjustment knob and run that that adjustment all the way up all the way down it should be free if if you if it's hard to crank you've over adjusted those gib screws they're too tight you need to back off another tenth of a turn until you get that to where it's it's smooth to operate up and down okay once you do that you can raise the bit up. You can visually do it. Use a dial indicator, whatever, whatever your method is for measurement. And then you want to lock in your lock knob for your height adjustment. As you're locking it in, you want to watch and make sure that, that what mine did is whenever I would lock it, it would literally come in 10 thousandths. Then if I unlock it, it would go back 10 thousandths. So this was moving all the time. So you couldn't get repeatability at all. Now I've, I've corrected that. That's what the video is for. So I hope this helps. Um, you know, um, some people might get the impression from my should have bought a stop, saw stop video that grizzly tools are horrible. And, you know, I get tons of emails saying, oh, you're comparing a, a $1,700 piece of equipment with a better piece of equipment at $3,000. No, I'm not. That might be what the cost of these, these tools are nowadays. What I'm comparing this to is in 1990s, I bought the same equipment. I had a Delta Unisaw, great white edition. I had bought a Jet, which I have it over here. There's a Jet bandsaw in the back that is a 14 inch bandsaw with a six inch riser on it. Um, I have a Jet uh, four inch joiner or six inch joiner, I'm sorry, six inch joiner and I had a jet three horsepower shaper and I had a Delta bench top planer. That's what I started with. And I've moved up to some of these. Now, when I moved, I had to sell all this equipment other than the, the two jet pieces that you see. My intentions were get rid of the heavy equipment that I couldn't move and replace it once I got here. Now I spent comparable money. I actually spent more money than I did in the early 90s to get the same equipment. This is the same shaper that I would have had in 1990, the same table saw I would have had in 1990. So when I say things, I'm comparing them back to that equipment. That's, I mean, for instance, my table saw, I think back then I spent $1,400 for that table saw. It did every, it had a Beastmeyer fence system, full extension table, everything. It was a dream. It worked great. I should have kept it, but I didn't. Um, same thing with the shaper. This shaper, I had the jet shaper I had, had a dust hood, a metal dust hood that fit it. It had a guard on it that you could work with. Um, I'm comparing that to what I had.
not to something that's on the market today. Yes, I said saw stop because I had an accident and safety was a factor. So if safety is your number one factor, then you can't go any better than saw stop. Not that, you know, how much are your fingers worth? How much is your hand worth? How much is, is a piece of your body worth? I mean, that's basically where it's at. You can buy Powermatic, you can buy Jet, you can buy name brand equipment and get better quality control than you can with this. I mean, every piece of equipment that I bought from Grizzly, it does do its job. You can work with it, I still do. But the point here is, is that when you buy a planer like that and you get it, it should have oil in it and it shouldn't be running out the side of the gearbox, you know, that's the issue. The issue is, is that I had to fix the planer before I could use it. I got these all at the same time. The shaper that I got from Grizzly, same issue. Deflection, 10 thousandths from the factory. That's quality control. That's not the equipment, not the ability to do work on it, not the safety factors in it. Although each one of these, um, the table saw and the shaper have, you know, I don't like their safety setups. They're, they're not use they're not practical let's just put it that way uh, i could do another video on that but probably people would hammer me for it uh, the table saw same way for that table saw for you to use the guard on it and have an anti-kickback device is just not usable i mean it's cheap and it's junk that's where they're that's where they're saving their money but um can you use this equipment and make furniture yes you can i i have you know i'm still using it today do i like it yeah, yeah, the planer, it's great. Since I fixed it, I haven't had any issues. Um, would I buy it again? Yeah, probably for the amount of money I saved and the, um, you know, what the function that it does. Yeah, yeah, I would buy it again. Would I buy the shaper again? Probably for the amount of money I saved. Yeah, now, you know, if I'd have bought an older jet or something like what I had before, paid half the money, I would have probably got almost the exact same thing without some of these issues. But, you know, it's all about trying to find something that fits in your budget. The table saw, would I buy it again? No, never. I mean, you know, that's getting into another video. So I just wanted to clarify some of that because I get tons of email about this saw that, uh, you know, oh, you're whining, you're comparing this, a Ferrari to a Volkswagen or whatever. No, I'm not. I'm comparing my my spending $1,400 in 1990 versus spending $2,200 for this in uh, 2017, I think, is when I bought this, all this equipment. So, you know, did I expect to get a $4,000 saw? No. Did I expect to get what I had from 1990 or better? Yes. Did I get that? No. So that's the issue with that. I'll go into a video later with that. I have a video on the um, dust collection hood for the... Uh, for the shaper that I had promised, but I had a tree fall on my shop. So I've been working with that and I'm trying to get other videos out. I did this because I had it apart for the dust collection hood. So I figured while well, I got it apart, let's fix the 10,000 deflection. If I can, if I can, then I'll do a video. If I can't, then I'll let you know that too. But uh, if uh, you have any questions on how to do any of this, or if you have any problems or whatever, and you want to contact me, then I'm happy. Just contact me and I'll help you in any way I can. So uh, take care, be safe, and keep all your fingers. Bye.